So good evening and welcome to Copperfield's Books virtual event with Chris Desser and Kirk Markwald. My name is Jamie Madsen and I'm the marketing and events coordinator here at Copperfield's Books and I'll also be your host for the evening. I want to take a moment here and again thank you all for your continued support through COVID-19. You supporting these online events allows us to continue to provide the free program and so for that we are very, very grateful. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started tonight. I'll be using the chat box to provide links to view upcoming Copperfields events, links and details for purchasing tonight's title, which will only be available inside Copperfields stores, and will also include my contact details for post event information. Additionally, the Q&A box will be your go to tonight with any questions or comments for the speaker. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see an icon that says Q&A. Please submit your questions here rather than replying to my post in the chat box. So without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce tonight's speakers. Chris Desser is an artist, writer, and advocate for progressive social change and hosts conversation with writers and activists on, enthusias on Enthusiasms, her radio show on KWMR. For four years, she, she has served in the Marin County Planning Commission, currently as vice chair. She previously served on the California Coastal Commission and the San Francisco Commission for the Environment. She was a fellow at the On the Commons, a think tank focused on developing the concept of the commons as an overarching analytical structure organizing across social sectors and disciplines. She is also an environmental lawyer, which I just learned from talking from her. Kirk Markwald is the founding principal of CEA Consulting and has been at the helm of, has been at the helm as principal since 1984. His deep experience in energy and environmental regulation provides the foundation for CEA's work with a variety of public and private sector clients. He has represented individual clients and trade associations before legislative and regular, regulatory agencies in California, as well as Washington, DC. We're really excited to have them here with us tonight. They are with us to discuss Huey D. Johnson's Something of the Marvelous. And for a story that spans, I think it's over 80 years, something of the marvelous is surprisingly timely, and I know we're all looking forward to diving in. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Chris. Why don't you take it away for us? Thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure uh, to be able to be here tonight to talk about Huey's wonder, mar marvelous book, something of the marvelous. Um, we, uh, we happened also to be married to each other, and... Huey married us. So we have a long and uh, deeply personal relationship with ex this extraordinary man who died not long ago, but left us with this book, which captures Huey's spirit in the most marvelous way. For those of you who aren't familiar with Huey, he was long revered as a giant of environmentalism. He founded many of the movement's most important organizations, the Trust of Public Land, Grand Canyon Trust, Greenbelt International and Resource Renewal Institute, which still exists in Mill Valley, a small but influential environmental think tank that he led for more than 30 years. He began his career as Western Regional Director for the Nature Conservancy, where he gained recognition for saving such iconic places as Maui's Seven Sacred Pools, Montana's Beartooth Ranch, and Canelo Hills Cienega Preserve in Arizona. He also helped acquire the Marin Headlands, just north of San Francisco, of course, and other significant parcels along the California coast, and we'll be talking about that in a bit. These acquisitions became part of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area and Point Reyes National Seashore, and the subject of a wonderful 2012 documentary film by Kenji Yamamoto and Nancy Kelly, Rebels Without a Cause, which we can commend to you with great enthusiasm. In 1978, Huey joined the cabinet of California Governor Jerry Brown as Secretary of Resources, where he transformed his department from one that enabled the exploitation of the state's natural resources by private industry into one supporting environmental sustainability and restoration. During his tenure, he was instrumental in preserving millions of acres of US public lands and protecting 1,200 miles of wild and scenic rivers. As a resource, resource renewal institute, he built on his Sacramento experience 
by developing programs with global applicability, such as green plans and fish in the fields. In recognition of this groundbreaking work and earlier achievements, he received numerous awards and honorary degrees, including the United Nations Environmental Program Sasakawa Prize, environmentalism's highest honor. Huey was known for his mentorship. At Resource Renewal Institute, he guided the careers of countless burgeoning environmentalists, many of whom went on to find that found their own consequential programs and organizations. He lived in Mill Valley with his wife, Sue, for nearly 60 years and died just a few weeks after completing the manuscript of his life story. And uh, Kirk was one of the people who benefited tremendously from Huey's mentorship. For sure. Um, thank you everybody for joining us this evening for the conversation. And we are gonna have a conversation and we're gonna leave plenty of time for going back and forth. So we'll have a conversation between us for 35 minutes or so. And then, and, and then to the extent there are questions, make sure to get to them and then we can tell more stories or go deeper into the book as, as uh, time allows. One thing, and, and Chris referred to my benefit of uh, Huey, one is a, a, a clear benefit of uh, serving as the number two person in the resources uh, agency when he was the secretary. So seeing uh, firsthand uh, his, William, his, his, his brilliance, his wisdom, his street fighter mentality, uh, Huey liked to used to say, I'd rather, I'd rather give them than get them in a way of, 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 you know, earning the approbation of being a thug for the good guys sometimes. But he believed that one needed to be resolute in resource battles and have a long-term view of the importance of productivity of those resources. At the same time, a curious mixture of being deferential and engaged with those very folks, timber companies, oil companies who controlled large parts of the resources. So it was a commend and criticize approach, but uh, a willingness to really engage and look over the horizon to leave a California better, more productive, more efficient than the one he uh, started with. And I think uh, his book details many of the pieces of how he did that while he was secretary. Well, let's talk a little about a, what might have been an unexpected path for someone who um, began as a Fuller Brushman and then worked for uh, a company that sold sausage casing uh, until he uh, discovered the Sand County Almanac. But uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about Huey's unconventional path to uh, the, the environmentalist he became and how the skills that he learned at a, as a salesman were things that served him his whole life in the most surprising ways. And he, and he talked about it repeatedly. It, yeah, and it's, it's one of the, I mean, of, of the many things that are interesting, were interesting to me in the book. It is this early pathway of serving as a salesperson. So of course, early on, he was a salesperson for sausage casing. But before that, Fuller Brush. Well, Fuller Brush, but the <laughs> people sausage- people even know what that, what that is. Yeah. But, but, the, but the sausage casing, I mean, that was a serious and a longer term thing. He was an up and coming guy. He got new territory, but in the course of it, you know, he learned at that point and he practiced uh, <laughs> notes that what he learned was he always needed to travel with a suit. Yes. Now that suit would have come from a thrift store, <laughs> I assure you. But nonetheless, Huey could put a suit on at a moment's notice to make an impression on a, on a queen or a prime minister or on a secretary of the environment. He knew how to rise to the occasion. And part of his salesmanship was how he looked and how he carried himself. And he, he put point to those early uh, days as a sausage salesperson or casing salesperson as uh, what, what taught him to do that. I, I don't know how many people are, are aware of how much our local uh, state and national landscape owes to Huey and how his work as an environmentalist and thinker, conservationist, policy leader, uh, and one-time regulator 
or is the reason that so much of the part of the country we live in, as well as other places, look the way they do. His, his efforts encompass the Northern California coast, Hawaii, the Grand Canyon, from national parks to pocket parks. He was an innovator with that when he was at the Trust for Public Land. He's protected millions of acres of wilderness and kept rivers and the salmon that need them wild and free. But the, it seems like the light bulb went on. I mean, the genesis of this was the Sand County Almanac right. by Aldo Leopold. Right. And I know that uh, he talks about it, it his first day at the Resources Agency. Didn't he give that book to everybody and then take a vacation? He did. <laughs> And I, this is a, my my predecessor, a, a fellow named Rich Hammond, who is a local and remains a local and an effective environmentalist, um, was was there uh, at that point. But that's exactly right. And I think he also told people that he appreciated their service up to them, and uh, that he hoped they would understand that if their services were no longer needed, it's after he was secretary. Here's the Sand County Almanac. I'm off for a few weeks vacation. Uh, well, I guess at, prior to the resources agency, of course, he was at the Nature Conservancy, and he actually created a, a new profession, strategic land acquisition, which I think we, those of us who are in this field, take somewhat for granted, whether it's something like Malt, uh, Marin Agricultural Land Trust, or the Land Trust in Sonoma, or other places around the country and even around the world, this is now a common tool for uh, land conservation, preservation, resource um, uh, preservation. But he actually created something that hadn't existed before at the Nature Conservancy. Can you talk about how that came about and then where it was initially deployed? Well, I, I think that the, the most famous place it was probably deployed is, is the acquisition in, in uh, Hawaii, but certainly not the only one. Huey had a, a remarkable characteristic of helping, uh, you know, parting wealthy people with their, from their money in favor of environmental protection. And so land acquisition uh, could appeal to both the vanity as well as the long-term commitment of these folks. And Huey had a way to tell the story to make everybody feel that if in fact they didn't step up at that very moment, uh, it would be lost forever. And in some cases that was absolutely true, but the only difference was Huey told it to 10 times as many people who we needed to raise money from. And you know, even if only three of them uh, or three of the 10 stepped up, he would have enough money to, to ply his trade. But it was creating a vision and particularly on species in Hawaii, he dispatched a person that I had the pleasure of knowing a little bit into the wild of the rainforest in Maui. And he came out having discovered a new species and seeing two species that had never been seen for, for 50 years. Well, wasn't the instruction to the ornithologist not to come out until he discovered a new species? Right, and he only had 10 days of food, so he needed to work quickly. Uh, but that's the kind of, you know, to, Huey had a view of how to instill a willingness in people to, to transcend their own time frame, their own life on the planet, and think bigger and think longer term. Well, he was incredibly persuasive as, as, as you are. As um, any sausage case has uh, to be. And, and, and he just had the classic, we could have some, if we had some eggs, we could have some ham and eggs if we had some ham. And he, would able to, he was able somehow to get that ham and eggs happening. I mean, the story about Hawaii had to do with Rockefeller. I mean, and did, did Rockefeller actually end up putting any money into that yes. project? How yes, did yes. that work? Well, I, I believe if I remember correctly that a, a silver-tongued real estate agent had told Lawrence Rockefeller that he had bought the pools. And what she didn't tell him is she had only bought three of the seven pools. <laughs> and Huey, knowing that would be somewhat of an embarrassment, 
uh, was able to put the money together for the rest of the acquisition. And maybe Lawrence Rockefeller threw in some additional dollars as well. But Huey saw the opportunity of, we're half, we're, you know, we're, we're three sevenths of the way there, let's push and get the rest of it done. Though there's great stuff in the book about how perilous it was until a certain event in New York where they were, they were running on fumes and, and all of a sudden magic happened. And he had the ability to create magic, uh, have magic happen on these long funding at, or public policy struggles. I mean, they were, you know, those are also come a little later in the resources agency. Well, closer to home, uh, Huey was very involved in Marincello and uh, as, as, as well as Bolinas, Kent Island, Stinson, but Marincello specifically is what led to the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. And of course, Rebels with a Cause tells that story, but can you speak to how that effort shaped our uh, geographic and environment, our, specifically our geographic and environmental experience right now? And of course, issues kind of continue, they always will, I suppose, but we're so fortunate. Yeah. You, you know, the, the best way to understand this is to get a hold of rebels with a cause because the, the story is told so beautifully in there. But, but, but the, the sum and substance of it is Huey had engaged Marty Rosen and Doug Ferguson and other and a couple of lawyers uh, in a battle of, of, with Gulf Oil around Marincello and the Gulf Oil people said to Huey, you know, Johnson, USOB, we're gonna bury you. Our, our lawyers are gonna bury you. You'll never be able to afford the legal cost. And Huey said, well, I don't think that's really true because you see, our lawyers work for nothing. <laughs> and ultimately the chair of Gulf Oil had to write Huey a uh, except from Huey, a small check in favor of this development, which if you, it, the film shows heliports and um, low rise, high rise activities. There were literally thousands of units of housing proposed. And for those of you who don't know, this is that tract of land just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. And if there, there is a certain off ramp coming south sort of the off-ramp to nowhere. So the off-ramp had already been built by Caltrans. I mean, this was a done deal. And uh, Huey had the delight, I believe, of driving the um, bulldozer that knocked the entry gate down at, at one point once it was done and settled. But again, it was find a cause, find somebody who believed in the cause, shoehorn the money together, have the confidence you were gonna win, and then just drive relentlessly. And of course, the, these stories are told with great detail and humor in something of the marvelous. So I encourage uh, encourage you folks to to acquire the book. You can, as you read it, it's it it it, it so sounds like Huey. It's uh, as as though he is he himself is speaking. Oh, and of course he is. But I mean, he captures his voice beautifully. Um, you had the great good fortune and benefited all of us in the state of California to work with you at the resources agency where you did uh, several, many, many significant things, but there were three initiatives that I remember uh, very well. I was living with you as you was, were, was, were working on them. The Investing for Prosperity, the Wild and Scenic uh, Rivers Project and Rare Two. And I wonder if you could talk about each of those and the, uh, again, the stories about how they came about, John Burton, for example, on Rare Two are, are wonderful, but how they came about and their significance to the state at the time, and now, many, many years later, the benefits that we are still, uh, that we have inherited due to Huey's tremendous vision, and of course, all of you terrific people that were working with him there. Well, I mean, I'll briefly talk about uh, in reverse order, but, but Rare Two, um, <laughs> The Forest Service had proposed to use a computer program to draw lines. What is rare stand? What is rare too? Roadless area, mm -mm, something or other. Uh, the and and the Forest Service had had written a, pro, a computer program that ostensibly picked up attributes of land and said, okay, well we'll draw the line of this boundary and 
this will be wilderness and that won't be wilderness. And, and a lot of the environmentalists were very happy that the Forest Service was even, th even thinking about wilderness. And Huey was not at all happy that computers were drawing the lines for natural resource decision-making. And Huey said, I'm suing the fire Forest Service. And the environmental community went berserk. And they said, how can you? You won't win. This is really dangerous. You know, we're, we, we, wanna, we wanna accept this and move on. And Huey said, we can't establish this principle that computers can draw lines on maps for, to create wilderness. And Huey sued and Huey won. And slowly the environmentalists were started to come in the front door again after coming in the back door to say, you know, Johnson, you were right. Well, basically the environmentalists had Kate. had asked for too little. Or had accepted a methodology that Huey thought was bankrupt. Um, the Wild and Scenic Rivers, um, some may remember back when there was a proposal to have a peripheral canal and in, uh, to move water to Southern California. Uh, part and parcel to that was to, to forever preserve uh, 1,500 miles of wild and scenic rivers in Northern California. So that the fear that if we had a peripheral canal, somehow they were gonna tap those North Coast rivers and send that water to Southern California, it was a break that story. And uh, a woman named Vera Marcus, uh, who may be on tonight, uh, who was a phenomenal uh, trooper uh, and a, a fellow named Brian O'Neill, who some of you may well have known when he was the head of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area, were the two designated federal and state officials. They had, I think, something like 156 days to turn around a combined federal state environmental document, uh, unheard of, impossible, never, never would, would uh, avoid litigation. Uh, they turned in a flawless document that was defended, I think, in six or seven different suits. And in fact, the last act of the Carter administration with Cecil Landris refusing to uh, resign at noon on the 19th, and this is quite interesting given what we've just been through, uh, refusing to uh, step away from his office at noon on the 19th to give the new team a chance to get settled. He said, I'm secretary until midnight and I intend to stay there. And in fact, about nine o'clock Eastern time, the last judge voted in our favor he sat there, we had an open phone line to the, to the interior department, he signed it and, and that was it. So 1500 miles, the Smith, the Van Dusen, the Trinity, the Eel and a section of the uh, American uh, are forever wild um, due to Huey's insistence that he was, didn't like the peripheral canal, but God damn it, if we had the peripheral canal, we were gonna protect those North Coast rivers. And, and I think, that it, when you mentioned Vera, it, it reminds me that Huey was not only someone who was deeply committed to environmental issues, he had a much bigger project of uh, egalitarianism and opportunities and, has, and certainly at the resources agency, but um, after that and probably before, he was a tremendous uh, supporter of women, of providing uh, chances for the untested, but but the eager and the willing to work hard. Mm -hmm. And of course, Vera has gone on to have a tremendous career. But I, I think that often these days where environmentalism is pitched against social justice, affordable housing, the economy, um, it is seen incorrectly as elitist rather than essential. And I was moved by uh, Vera Marcus's statement in the book that she sees environmentalism as the mother movement without which all other causes are impossible. We have to find a way to make the earth last. And this was really like Vera's kind of first foray into significant policy work. And, and she just was relentless and committed. And it, um, we have Huey to thank for giving Vera that opportunity and, uh, and many, many others since. Well, 
Well, and it was, and he, you're right about his commitment and the way it was uh, created was that, <clears throat> you, you know, the, the leadership of the resources agencies, managing departments uh, was overwhelmingly white. And Huey created a, a fellows program in which 20 or 30, 20 probably around 20 people a year were selected uh, out of the civil service. They were given uh, a master's program at Sac State in environmental science. They were given rotations in all the key departments sitting at the, uh, at the desk of the director or the deputy director to see how policy was actually made. And then one or two evenings a, a, a month with Huey to talk about big policy issues. And those folks, even just while I was there, greatly accelerated their exposure, their experience and their place in the world of the resources agency. And some of them are still there. Another very significant project that you were involved with uh, at the resources agency was investing for prosperity. Can you talk about the genesis of that? And, and, and again, what we have inherited as a result? Huey had a view that um, resources were never, there was never enough money to invest in the sustainability of, of natural resources. And the way that, um, that he chose to attack that is first you had to deal with the funding sources. So we've got the legislature to pass a bill or a, a series of bills that dedicated if the state was making money from a forestry sale, that that money would go to deal with rehabilitation of the forest. And if the state was making money from the offshore oil re, uh, revenues, that money perhaps would go to restore salmon streams or uh, fisheries program, other fisheries programs or soil conservation or energy conservation. So taking basically income streams from non-renewable resources and investing them in the, in the renewables future. So it was a fabulous program uh, supported bipartisanly by Republicans and Democrats and certainly by Jerry Brown at the time who was the governor. Uh, but the, and the legislature was able to say, Johnson, we don't like some of your policies, but here you're thinking clearly about the long-term well-being of California. Huey was, was properly concerned that the attractiveness of California and the burgeoning populations would outrun our water, our ability to have clean air, the ability to have what was the emergent world of clean energy and, and committed himself to creating that kind of an investment program. I think you had a story that you wanted to tell about Spindrift? Well, that goes, you know, that goes really to, um, you, we could find these little gems and there's a, those of you who've ever been to Muir Beach, if you walk up the road, at the very top of the road of the residential area, there is a place called Spindrift. And uh, Huey had met the person who owned it. It's not a huge property at all, but it is a gem all right, on the right on the coast overlooking the cove of, of Muir Beach. And Huey had worked and worked and worked on this and uh, and with some success. But then he, um, the owner, as I remember, was always wanting to have another cafe at the Cafe Sport or another lunch at Greens and over and over and over again. And at one point Huey was, has been away uh, from California and the owner wrote Huey and said, Huey, hurry back. There's important work for you to do here. And that really is the essence of the way Huey approached land conservation, California and engagement with individuals. He, he could tap into what was important and, and move people. 
uh, and, and, and he has done so at the Resource Renewal Institute. And I'll give a bit of a plug for them. Uh, under the ABLE uh, stewardship of Deb Moskowitz, a co-sponsor of this event tonight, um, by all means, go on their website, look at the other, some of the other programs that Huey has done, um, the, you know, the, the world of paying attention to people who have come before this elders project that they've done, the, the Grand Canyon Trust, uh, Fish in the Fields. I mean, they're really an unbelievable Talk uh, about fish, fish in the Fields. It's such a, on the one hand, obvious, and on the other hand, creative and innovative uh, um, idea, which it turns out Native Americans have been using like time and memorial, but was forgotten. But maybe you could talk about that project a little. Well, if anyone ever called Huey's cell phone for the last 15 years, hi, Huey's here. I'm probably salmon fishing. Leave me a message. Salmon uh, were, are, for all of us, an indicator species, but they were particularly close to Huey's heart. And he also had this ability to um, engage innovative solutions where they otherwise were not, um, were not really understood. So salmons, as they come down the Sacramento River, they go through all sorts of predation. They go through challenging water, they go through predators. And Huey came up with the idea that we have these flat fields that are flooded. Why don't we, why don't we- With rice. You mean. With yes. rice, but, but also without rice. Why don't we short stop and give the salmon a little chance to grow? Well, like all great inventors, that actually worked. But what, what really Huey discovered in his relentless reading of literature, and he, he makes one observation just as a bit of a side observation, Huey read at least one hour every day to learn something new. And he talks about one of the most significant factors in his childhood were the Carnegie Library. Yep. And that was where he developed his lifelong habit. So, so part of his reading here, he began to understand the ability of carbon reduction by virtue of fish in these fields. So it, the salmon piece evolved now into a different idea or a co-idea. It was also a hell of an idea to reduce, reduce carbon. And um, I recently talked to the Department of Fish and Game people, and it's one of the ideas that they are really looking at, uh, working with the Department of Far with the uh, Food of Agri Food and Agriculture Department to figure out a way. We need to lessen the environmental impact of rice, and it used to burn the root rice, which was really hideous. But they don't do that anymore. But if there's a way to to deal with the carbon that's in the water, then it can be win-win. We can have protein production. We can have reduction of carbon. We can get additional revenue streams to farmers to keep those lands open, to avoid them becoming just part of the suburbanization of California. And, and Huey had this idea and was there with, you know, not quite picks and shovels, but, but absolutely full spirit and finding the best technical people. And so while his amazing time at, as the first Western regional director for the Nature Conservancy, which is now a multi-billion dollar operation, founding, co-founding the Trust for Public Land, serving as a resources agency secretary, founding the Resources Renewal Institute. But even in the later years, eagerly, relentlessly looking for things that would make the planet better. Well, um, I, I would love to open this up to comments or questions, but. Uh, there's two quotes from Huey in the book that I think that uh, project embodies. And one is, he says, I spent my whole life noticing and exploring the co connectedness of what others considered unrelated. And later in the book, he says, to solve anything, you have to solve everything. And I get chills when I 
read either of those statements because they resonate with such truth for me. And it was really how Huey's mind worked. He liked to call himself a generalist who knew how to hire specialists. I think that the, this kind of thinking is the thinking of a generalist who can see relationships and understand that uh, everything is connected to everything else. And every, it, it, it is really a paradigm shifting way of thinking and understanding yeah. how to deal with the uh, issues that, that, that face us, uh, especially now um, with climate change, for example, and, and the uh, huge uh, ripples and consequences of that gigantic issue. Well, I think there's one other uh, mantra that he had, while it's not quoted in the book. Um, when, when looking at an issue, Huey always felt that it's not much harder to do something big right than do something small right. So why wouldn't you do something big? And, and I can tell you, um, as one who ran around trying to figure out, oh my God, how are we possibly going to do this? The idea of, it, it wasn't about big or small, it was about doing it right. And that in fact, if you were going to do the work to do it right, it might as well be big and make it worth your while. So Jamie, I, should we look at the questions? And uh, from Emily P, what might Huey tell California leaders today about wildfire mitigation and land use planning? Uh, well, I think the first thing that he would say is that the Forest Service, as most many people know, a lot of our fires have had a, a combined private land, federal land attribute. And the Forest Service, which had a mantra of never bigger than 10 acres and always out at 10 o'clock in the morning, set the California on the wrong track. And I think California followed some of that on our private lands as well and our public lands. So the first thing is we need to get the forest back to what they looked like uh, when our Native American folks inhabited the world, which fire was often a part of it, but it wasn't a conflagration. It was, it was managed. And, and luckily, I think some of the wildfire work now is reincorporating uh, native approaches, but in the, the amount of underbrush and problem that we have now, the second thing he would say, and it was part of the Investing for Prosperity program, which was quaintly called chaparral management. And chaparral was as the overgrown brush that'll throw a flame. There's so much fuel in the, in the brush, it'll throw a flame length like 20 feet and with any wind, that will be a quarter mile away and in 10 seconds. So getting rid of the brush is really essential. C creating defensible refuge is really essential. But really, it's, it, it, it'll be a generation to rework the way we've approached management so far in order to be successful. Similarly, I guess, what, what would Huey have to say about the water issues that we're facing in this state? and how to deal with that I mean, population. Well, obviously he was concerned that population was gonna, was gonna um, outrun our ability to deal with water and, and didn't foresee, I think did not foresee the, the fact of what the consequences would be of the drought and, and of, of climate change. So I, I, you know, I think you know, reduce, reuse, conserve, um, and he would have a much stronger regulatory program, I think, on, on groundwater, which we're beginning to do in the state, but I think that, that that's really the, the pace that, that he would focus on. We have one more question. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes our audience can be shy. Um, <laughs> I will say that I've been getting a lot of comments just thanking us and, and telling me that they really enjoy listening to the two of you. Um, 
so I don't know if you have maybe anything else you can touch on together, but um, of course, one thing that is, you know, with everything that's been happening in 2020 and then the fires up here and what's something that just the average person, you know, it seems so stressful when you think of trying to do such a big, solve a big problem well, like what's something that the everyday person can do to do well by the environment? Um, get outside. Enjoy it. Find a local park, find a state park, find a federal park, uh, find a stream that needs rehabilitation, uh, find a tree planting effort that speaks to you. There are lots of things that people can do and they, they, they fold in on each other and reinforce dramatically, you know, the fact that we are not at the, at the mercy of all these big forces. Um, and I, I do a lot of work with the park here in Point Reyes, um, mm -hmm. which you and I had some differences about uh, because he was so fundamental in creating the park. He had a very strong view about they're doing this wrong. And in some cases, I agree with him. And in other cases, um, you know, your creative conflict was the way Huey liked to deal with these kinds of conversations. So I'm very comfortable with creative conflict with him. But I think what he agreed was make a little bit of nature better. Do what you can. And, and the, the therapeutic value of being outside, of connecting with like-minded people, uh, I think is strongly, strongly uh, that he would endorse that kind of activity. I think that um, um, not enough is known perhaps about the fact that, that urban environmentalism at, at TPL, I mean, it was really the creation of these so-called pocket parks and understanding that uh, cities were, it, the environment wasn't just someplace out there, nature wasn't just out there, but that cities also were an environment and the natural world existed in cities as well. And I was very gratified just today to read about Obama's new library in Chicago because it is a very integrated approach to a presidential library. It, 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 it's a pretty big building for sure, but it's in a park. And it's got, um, and the top, uh, on the very top of it, it's a public access for people to enjoy the views from up there. There's, I think that there's a pond, there's, there's a, an area for children, especially. And of course, to me, it also reflects um, Obama's mind and the way that, that o Obama approached things in a very integrated and ecological in, in the most, uh, uh, true sense way, but it remind I, I don't know that he even he knew Huey. He might have, but the fact that he's that a park is in his mind as he's creating his presidential library, and but not only a park. The library is in a park. They are connected to each other. And this was a the, this uh, among the many things that Huey did. These were the kinds of programs that he developed at TPL. That, as I say, we sort of take for granted now, but they didn't really exist prior to that in no, the same way. Yeah, no, and I think his experience at the Nature Conservancy made him realize that the crown jewels, the massive, wonderful vistas, landscapes, certainly deserve to be preserved and needed to be preserved. But if you fail to bring the hearts and minds of the urban populations along, that sooner or later, that would be viewed as foreign to them. So the trust for public land really was based on taking this little two acre piece, taking this former estate that had five acres around it, recovering green belts along the rivers, moving highways off of, off of riverine environments and creating parks, allowed people to, to get that kind of connection. And, and also at the resources agency, um, when we did the Investing for Prosperity program, we had urban fishing, we had urban forestry, we had educational programs, we had the California Conservation Corps, all of which were, were seeking to provide an educational forum or a, a moment for urban dwellers. So I, I think, you know, he, he definitely had that deep appreciation. Now, I think that um, your suggestion and advice that people get 
outside um, and see the world around them, whether it is wilderness or whether it is urban or whether it's something in between goes just to Huey's point that everything is connected to everything. And our behavior will change when we understand that everything is connected to everything. And one of the benefits, if there could be said to be any from the, you know, what we're dealing with now with COVID and how it's affecting our lives is the reduction in pollution as a result. So this is uh, something that people just, I think we're taking for granted. It's always going to be this way um, until things stopped. And suddenly we realize it doesn't always have to be this way. And that has to do with getting out and noticing, noticing what things feel like, how they could be different. And as the world opens again, which of course we're hoping it will, how can we live in it in a way that might be different and more healthy for humans and all the other creatures that share the planet with us? I saw that there was something from Rich Hammond, but it just disappeared. Jamie, do you have a note from Rich Hammond? Um, yes, I'm sorry, but that answer was just beautiful and I loved it. Um, let me go ahead from Richard. Hi, Kirk and Chris, Rich here. You might speak about Huey and Jerry and Phil Greenberg and nuclear energy versus renewable energy as another version of natural systems. Also, maybe mention one Merriam and net energy concepts. Also, had to laugh, <laughs> Huey D. Johnson did not pass a Sand County Almanac at the first meeting, did not pass out. <laughs> Rather, he asked two people if they'd read it and they'd not heard of it. Everyone got the point and it caused a run on that title at all the local bookstores and libraries for the following weeks. <laughs> and Kirk, who was Rich Hammond? <laughs> so uh, I was... Uh, asked to fill the very large shoes of Rich Hammond when he chose to leave. Uh, and Rich was my predecessor. Uh, I, I think the nuclear- As Huey's deputy. Uh, yes, yeah, wow. as Huey's deputy. I, I think that the, the, the nuclear, um, what Rich referred to uh, in, the, in the nuclear world, uh, California had um, a, a new, nuclear power plant on the books. And Huey uh, called Sun Desert. And they were diligently trying to cite it at the, at the California Energy Commission. And Huey hired uh, a, a good friend of all of ours uh, named Phil Greenberg, who was precise and insistent and giving Huey exactly the ammunition he needed to look at every imaginable point of authority that the state of California had to influence how this came. And um, Phil and Huey as the leader, Phil as the, as the thought partner, uh, basically uh, ended uh, Sun Desert's uh, certification program at the Energy Commission. Um, Interestingly, for those of you who know about loving a proposal to death, the Energy Commission actually approved it with 92 conditions or some such thing. So they, they say face approving it, but they conditioned it in such a way that it was never built. Uh, and, it, and a serious uh, moment to now we have a nuclear power plant in Southern California called Songs that has recently closed. And we have the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant at pg and &E that is on its way to being closed. So we will have a nuclear free future in large part uh, to Phil Greenberg and Huey Johnson's work. Richard had a, a follow-up comment. He said, Phil, who had been lead guitarist for a SF rock band turned into anti-nuclear activist with Huey's bride, Susie Johnson. <laughs> That's right. That's right. What a story. I can't believe he married you guys as well. It's special. <laughs> I don't know. I, we, I, we may be the only couple that were married by Huey. <laughs> um, and I want to be clear that we bought the Minister for Life from the <laughs> Universal Life Church. We didn't skimp on a one-time only. So 
He, uh, no, no, didn't he marry Pam Wing and, and uh, oh, and John, John McCosker? McCosker? I said, I, th I think, I, don't that, know, Rich I, th I think he amortized the Rich cost of Anna and the Rich, A train. Rich, Rich Hammond might have a view on that. I don't know. <laughs> well, but, we, but he didn't need to stay. He was a man of many talents. So this was, he was a man of the cloth as well as an environmentalist. Sounds like it. I hope you got some pictures. I know. <laughs> not, not, I mean, going to his versatility at his going away party. Uh, we were big on potlucks in the 70s, as you remember. She probably doesn't remember. <laughs> Huey, Huey was living with us at the time. And Huey made a, a casserole of oh, <laughs> indeterminate uh, parts of something. And he, we went to the, the uh, going away party, and um, I think he was pulling people's leg, but he suggested that uh, it was roadkill stew. <laughs> and we had some very um, uh, delicate people who worked with us, and just the thought that it might have been, or that he would even think of that. It was, it wasn't out of the realm of possibility. Oh no, I mean, it, it may well have been, it may well have been road kills too. That's a great story. I don't want to forget uh, to include Claire's um, comment here. Huey once told me that if I was really serious about making a difference in California politics, that I should go duck hunting with him. That's where all the policy decisions in California get made. Did either of you ever go duck hunting with Huey? Did you cut? Did. Yeah, oh, there's a couple more questions. I'll just kind of finish <laughs> wrapping up. Did you cut any details in the reeds or the blinds? I always wanted to go, but never was able to work out the timing with him. Claire Greensfelder, great job, you two. By the way, I've listened to Huey stories forever. <laughs> well, and Claire, um, we bow to Claire, who is a, a tremendous nuclear activist in her own right, uh, among many other things. But um, thanks for tuning in, Claire. You know, Claire, we, I couldn't cut any deals because I was in his, in his servitude. So I didn't have any opportunity to cut deals. But it really does go, and it goes back to what Huey's earlier comment, of the earlier comments I made about Huey, which was that he understood that he was comfortable um, engaging people who spent a lot of time in duck blinds. And he spent a lot of time in duck blinds in order to kill ducks, because Huey, I don't think, bought commercial meat for the last 25 years of his life. Venison, elk, duck, other, other, uh, other creatures, pheasant as well. But he knew that sitting around having a scotch and debating resource politics and the like, even though they, some of these people hated Huey, that he was entertaining, he would get under their skin and sometimes get them to give them large sums of money for projects. So he really did cut deals and duck blinds. And the only difference is, is you really need to be comfortable being, you know, in a duck blind at 3.45 in the morning, uh, which I was never that fond of myself. And I never, I didn't go hunting, but I was, I went fishing with Huey and that was a great thing to do. And, and Huey had a, again, a facility for uh, befriending people with fishing boats and other vehicles that, duck made, that made the hunting and fishing possible. And of course he was, he was quite, he was a hunter of wild boar as well, was he not? Yeah, anything actually. <laughs> He sounds like such a character, man. It's so sad. It just last July, was it that he passed away? Um, you know, um, Malcolm said Huey gave me a grant of two thousand dollars in nineteen seventy two that led to the founding of Heyday Booze. <laughs> wow, I didn't know <laughs> Heyday Books. I mean, that oh, might have okay. been books, but I think he means Heyday Books. <laughs> that's even more. That's huge. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's really. I'm. I'm so honored. To, uh, the people that are listening tonight, Malcolm, thank you for for tuning in and and sharing that story. Um, because heyday and the uh, and the the Malcolm's legacy, uh, Malcolm Margolin's legacy is an astonishing 
and wonderful thing. I guess I'm waiting for Malcolm's book so that we can be talking about that. I mean, truly, truly. We're all ready for you, Malcolm, when you want to have it live. <laughs> so let's let's wrap up on, um, well, we have two last comments. Um, Claire said, he used to come to barbecues at my house and bring venison or elk for the grill. Even some of the vegetarians gave it a try. He was so persuasive, which I love. Um, and then Mike Painter said, Huey loved to use his boat for salmon fishing. Once when an environmental official from New Zealand was visiting, he took us all in his boat to Belvedere from San Francisco for a reception on the bay in the afternoon in the wind. And we all arrived there soaked. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that was just the, you know, that was a consequence of, you tell that story many times, Mike Painter, long, <laughs> long suffering and long serving uh, person also in Huey's servitude at one point. Um, but Huey would think that that was just part of the deal. You know, of course you were gonna go by boat and yeah, you were outside, you were gonna get wet. But it would be fun and interesting. And the person from New Zealand would tell that story many times when he got home about this crazy guy in California who got me soaked. I really appreciate you both taking the time. This has been an awesome hour and just a, a really, I feel like I lived it. It's been great to reminisce. Something of the Marvelous by Huey D. Johnson um, is available in Copperfields. I will be sending an email tomorrow with a link to rewatch this event, as well as further details about how to get the copy through Copperfields. Thank you both Kirk and thank you, Chris. It was such an honor. I'm gonna go ahead and let you take us out. Thank you. It was really, it's always fun to talk about Huey as various participants have demonstrated. And um, it, was, it was a privilege to have such a friend. And the book, as I say, uh, brings him back to us. I, I really recommend it highly. It's, it's a joy to read. Yeah, it, it, it is a surprisingly well written. Um, Huey sometimes could be a little um, repetitive and whatever, but he really zeroed in. And the, the lessons here are simple, straightforward, and humorous. It's a great book. And, and, Enjoy and, and, it. and applicable, be, applicable beyond environmentalism. Yeah. It's a way of living in the world. Yep. And it's uh, well said. A, a way we should all strive to live in the world. Well, we Thank you all. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Hope to have you back soon. Great. Bye-bye.